Hi, this is Tim Grage, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, and welcome again to another episode of Frenesis. Today I want to talk to you about something that's very close to my heart. I want to talk to you about praying effectively, praying effectively. Of course, when you talk about praying, one of the key scriptures that should readily come to mind is James chapter 5. Let me read something to you. I'm reading from the Amplified, okay? It says, confess to one another, therefore, your faults, your slips, your false steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that you may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. He then says, the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available that is dynamic in its working. He says, the earnest, meaning there was passion, heartfelt, and what I want to push here is continued. It says continued prayer. It means he's talking about the fact that this prayer was consistent. He wasn't a visitor in the place of prayer. Remember how the Bible says uh, that he that dwelleth in the secret place. It didn't say that he that visits. Jesus was also speaking. He says, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, to abide means it is something that is consistent. It is something Something that is constant. When you notice the, the people that were in scripture and even in modern day that have been able to make great impacts uh, from the kingdom of God into the, the, the realms of this world, you will notice that there were people of strong, consistent prayer. The Bible is speaking about Daniel. It says that Daniel, in spite of how busy he was, he had scheduled prayer three times a day. David, speaking about praise and his time in prayer, talked about how seven times a day. This was the king of, a, of an entire land and he had actually even annexed other kingdoms and yet he was saying he found time, sometimes seven times a day to pray. Prayer was not an appendage. Prayer was not a spare tire. Prayer was not a last resort. The, the Bible says here it was an earnest, heartfelt continued prayer. Continued prayer. The Bible then talks to us about Elijah and I don't know if I will have time if, uh, to finish this but if I don't maybe we'll pick up pick it up the next time we meet. He says, Elijah was a human being with a nature such as we have. That means he had feelings, affections, and a constitution like ours. I'm still on James 5. I'm now on verse 17, amplified. He says, and he prayed earnestly for it not to rain, and no rain fell on the earth for three years and six months. Verse 18, though, says, and then he prayed again. That is, you can't get past the necessity to be consistent, the necessity to be continuous. It is is this consistency in prayer that causes your voice to be recognized in the realms of the spirit on the earth and even in the corridors of hell. He says, and he prayed again. I've come to say to somebody, before I even explain what it means to pray effectively, I need to encourage you to pray again. Remember when Elijah began to pray. The Bible says that as he prayed, he will send his disciple to go check whether the rain was coming. And his servant will come back and say, there is no rain. This is, I think, in 1 Kings 18. There is no rain. Elijah didn't say, oh my goodness, this thing is not working. I've already sent this man twice, three times, and, and, and he's coming back and, and he's saying that nothing is working. And many of us are like that. When we begin to pray and we are not seeing immediate turnaround, we begin to conclude maybe this thing is not working. But Elijah understood that the power in prayer is in praying. The power in, of prayer is in the prayer of it. So he knew that if nothing has happened, the solution was not to quit. The solution was to persist. Have you been there before? You're, you're trying to start your car. Remember those days when our cars used um, um, keys and it, it, you, not once where you put, push a button and you start your car. You had to put the key in the ignition. You had to crank the car to start. When you put the key in your ignition and it's not starting, you know, it's not turning. Do you remove the key, then take the key to your house and put it in the ignition. No, you don't do that. Do you now take the key to your to your wardrobe and put it in the ignition? No. You use the same key. At best, you go get a similar key, which we call a spare key. But it's a similar key. It's the same key that you put because you know that the key to use is just this key. The same thing here. The solution is in that place of consistency in prayer. If you are not seeing the results yet, like Elijah, do you know what Elijah must have been going through? The servant is coming back saying, nothing is happening. I would not be surprised if voices were saying to Elijah, I hope you know your servant is now thinking that you're crazy. 
that you are going to be sitting here, head between your thighs, and you are going to pull down rain. Those thoughts will be plaguing Elijah's mind that save yourself the shame and just tell the servant that, no, don't worry, don't check again. When the rain comes, it will come. No, Elijah kept on sending his servant because he knew, my goodness, I have worked and worked with this before, and it does work. It worked then. It will work now. It will always work. He stayed with it. Now, I want you to look at something. In that story of 1 Kings 18, I don't have time to really dwell on it, but I will encourage you to go read it from verse 42 to 44, because the next time we meet, we're going to expantiate on it. There are some key truths that we need to extricate from, from Elijah's experience in praying at the top of Mount Carmel to pull down rain. When we read it in verse 42, it says, so Ahab went up to eat and drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. That is the first step. Elijah, when he was going to pull down rain, I don't know where you need rain in your life, he went to the top of Carmel. So the first point is he went up. He wasn't praying from the position of his humanity. You need to assume your divine position when you are going to pray. What am I saying? When Moses was crying out to God in Exodus 14 saying, the Egyptians are coming right in front of me and he was crying. Do you know the response? I think it was from verse 15. The response from God was, why are you crying to me? Because at that point, Moses was speaking from his humanity. You can't speak from your humanity. You have been baptized in into Christ. Romans 6 verse 3. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 20, Paul said we pray in Christ's stead. When we're going to pray, we must assume our divine status and we pray as Christ will pray. Did you hear me? If your praying is not as Christ will pray, if that prayer you're praying, Christ cannot pray it. Your prayer is in vain. Stop praying from your humanity like Elijah. Go to the top of the mountain and like Elijah pray from your position of divinity I'm out of time I'm going to dwell more on this how what does it mean to pray from my position of divinity and a few other thoughts with regards to praying effectively because if I can get you to pray effectively you will change your world I hope you've been blessed I hope you will engage God's word and you will pray again God bless you this has been Tim Grage of the city of Zion Catch you again sometime soon. Bye for now. Hi, this is Tim Gray, Senior Pastor of the City of Zion, and welcome to another episode of Phronesis. I want to talk to you or continue my thought with you concerning praying effectively. The last time I spoke about this, I drew our attention to the fact that in James chapter 5, it was speaking from verse 16, it was speaking about the effectual prayer of the righteous. And I emphasized that in the Amplified Version, it talked about the heartfelt, continued prayer. And we looked at the fact that prayer must be continuous. You cannot be a visitor in the altars of God. We also looked at verse 17. Again, this is still in the Amplified. And he said that it, verse 18 actually says, and Elijah prayed again. He prayed again. You must remember that in that story, when Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and was going to pray, his servant went and came back and there was nothing. But Elijah did not give up. Elijah stayed in the place of prayer because he knew that he had sampled this before it worked and it was going to work again prayer cannot be an appendage it cannot be a spare time it cannot be something we do out of convenience remember the Bible speaking about Daniel he said he prayed three times a day David talked about how he prayed seven times or praise God seven times in a day the Bible speaking about Jesus made it clear that he had a custom of retreating to a place of prayer if Jesus who was God incarnate had to retreat to the place of prayer Prayer is our advantage. Prayer then must be a necessity. Somebody asked Smith Wigglesworth how often he prayed, and he said, I don't pray longer than 30 minutes. And the person said, only 30 minutes? And he said, and I don't spend longer than 30 minutes without praying. He was basically saying he spent every other 30 minutes in a state of prayer. No wonder his results were phenomenal. People listening might be saying, yeah, maybe they had all the time. Maybe they were pastors. That was all they were doing. And that's why 
they were able to pray, you and I know that that's a lie. The whole, the whole idea of not having enough time is an illusion. Let me put it this way. If somebody was to say to you, every time you spend 30 minutes in prayer, you were given a million dollars, will you suddenly have time? Oh, I'm sure some of you are smiling. Suddenly, you will realize you have all that time in the world. You will even say, can you push it to an hour at a time? So the issue is not that you don't have time. You don't yet see the value of prayer. And I don't blame you. Some of us don't see the value of prayer because we have not learned to pray effectively. So how do we pray effectively? Let's take our thought again from 1 Kings 18, verse 42. It says, so Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Carmel. And he cast himself down upon the earth, and put his face between his knees. Our first stop here is he went up to Mount Carmel. I told you the last time we were together that this meant that he was praying not from his humanity, position of his humanity, but from the position of his divinity. Saints of God, I'm fond of saying this. When you are going to pray, you need to answer the question, who is praying? Because if it's Tim Grage praying, then we are saying that God should answer based on my meritocracy. And I have, I don't have enough merit with the divine to receive anything from him. And uh, so the idea is, am I coming in the name of Jesus? Saints, what it means to come in the name of Jesus is not to use the name as an addendum to signal the end of your prayer. To say in the name of Jesus means you are coming in the rights and privileges, not of your own, but of Jesus himself. No wonder in Romans 6, 3 says, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, um, were baptized into his death, you have been baptized into Christ. To be baptized means you have been put in Christ. It, Galatians 3.27 puts it like this. It says, for as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You need to understand when you are going to pray that you have been placed in Christ. So the prayers you are praying, you need to be conscious that it is Christ that is praying it. No wonder First Peter uh, talks about us speaking as the oracles of God, as the mouth peace of God. The prayers you are currently praying, can Jesus pray them? You will remember, I think it was in Genesis 27. Isaac asked Jacob, are you my very son Esau? Esau was the firstborn, remember that. And Esau was the one that was Isaac wanted to give the birthright to. And Jacob dressed up as Esau and came to meet Isaac. Isaac recognized the voice, he did. He, you know, he knew something was off. And he asked Jacob, are you my very son Esau? Isaac was blind. And Jacob said, yes, I am your very son Esau. What happened there was instructive to you and I. Jacob was coming in the rights and privileges of their firstborn. Their firstborn was Esau. Our firstborn is Jesus. You can't come in your name. You must come in the name and in the consciousness that it is the firstborn's rights that you are presenting. You need to renew your mind. That way, when you stand, it is Christ that is standing there. The Bible says you are baptized into Christ. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 23, he says that we pray in Christ's stead as though it is Christ praying. In Hebrews 12, 23, it says we have come to the church of the firstborn. He could have said the church of Jesus, but he says the church of the firstborn. In the kingdom of God, we have all been baptized into the firstborn. So we all have received the rights and the inheritance of our firstborn. His name is Jesus. So the first question is, who is praying? You need to ensure that you are praying and you are coming as the firstborn as Christ. The second thing you will notice is that the Bible says in that verse 42, he put his head between his knees. He shut the world out. The noise from within, the noise from without, the people and the noisemakers, he put them out. Remember when Jesus was going to pray and bring back to life the daughter of Jairus. Can you remember what happened? The people were there, so many of them crying and wailing. The Bible says he put them out of the room. He drove them out of the room and kept in that room only the parents and his disciples with the girl. Why? Because he needed to put his head between his knees, meaning he needed to silence, the no you need to silence the noise. There are some people that are around you that are feeding your mind with doubt and unbelief. You need to silence the noise. You need to turn off the news uh, channel because it's feeding you with fear, doubt and unbelief. You need to remove the distraction. He looked 
inwards. Do you understand? He kept his eye in our case. Well, looking inward will mean keeping our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because Colossians 1 27 tells us that Christ in us is the hope of glory. He kept his eye. You must keep your eye on Jesus knowing that it doesn't matter um, that these variables are wrong and that is wrong. Christ in me de 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 demands that I must be heard. Saints of God, you need to go up and answer the question, who is praying? And number two, you need to shut out the distractions. Next time we meet, we'll complete this thought. There are a few more things I want you to get. But again, I pray that your prayer life is stirred up. There is answers are waiting for you. It's waiting there for you in the secret place. God bless you. This has been Tim Grage on Phronesis. Bye for now.